Okay, ma'am, we are going live in three, two, one. Please start. We are live. Live now. Yes, ma'am. We are live. Please start. Good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Sampurna Ghosh, consultant ENT surgeon in Medicare Hospital, Hyderabad. It's my pleasure to start today's session on invasive fungal sinusitis, clarifying the gray areas of treatment protocol. It's our great pleasure to have the stalwarts with us, Dr. Janki Ram, who is a legend in pelvic endoscopic pelvic surgery from Royal Pal Hospital in Trichy. Along with him, uh, Dr. Shobhan Babu, who is the HOD of ENT department in Gandhi Medical College, that has been an excellent teacher and has been uh, training a lot of uh, uh, newcomers and PGs. We also have Dr. Anthony, who is professor in Chennai Medical College, who has a vast experience with the tackling the skull based lesions in this infective pathology. And uh, we also have, uh, other than ENT, uh, we have the other subspecialties as well. I have my friend, Dr. Naveen, who is an excellent maxillofacial surgeon and an academic person. And uh, last but not the least, Dr. Ashi, the young and enthusiastic ophiloplastic surgeon who has been doing a lot of uh, ophiloplasty work, uh, taking out the eyeball, also the reconstruction part, along with the ENT team in Hyderabad. So um, we also have Dr. Shilpi Bhatia Sharma. Dr. Shilpi's name I uh, uh, said already, I think. Dr. Shilpi is ENT consultant who also has a very good experience in endoscopic salvage surgery. And she has been treating the mucor cases and a lot of experience in the follow-up as well. So uh, that's an addition. Uh, welcome all the doctors. And uh, so this session is basically... Uh, uh, not only to show surgical videos, but also to clarify a lot of uh, uh, mysterious points because the disease is not well known to all of us. We never seen this kind of surge of mucor cases before and maybe we'll never see this again. So we are still learning the pathology. We, there are uh, a lot of confusion regarding the diagnostic protocol, how long the follow-up should be given, the amphobi doses, and uh, how much debridement or how, how aggressive we should go. So we'll start from the very basic, which is uh, from the symptom, then gradually we'll go to the radiology, the microbiology, the biopsy, the uh, surgical decision making, including the maxillofacial and the skull based debridement. So starting from uh, the very basic that previously we read like in textbooks that who are the people who gets infected very sick patients, cancer patients, diabetic ketoacidosis, unlike that, this time the scenario is completely different. So uh, my first question to uh, Dr. Anthony, because you are in a medical college, you get a lot of patients from different socioeconomic status. So how many of pa your patients, post-COVID patients uh, with mucormycosis had been treated in hospital and how many were home treated? And what percentage of patients were steroid received or what were only diabetic? See, the post-COVID scenario, the patients who get, uh, there is no question of uh, the, the people who are uh, primarily getting treated in the home. As soon as you have a suspicion, we have a beautiful uh, MUPAR clinic, which includes a physician, a diabetologist, a neurologist, um, uh, uh, facility to do a diagnostic nature endoscopy and take biopsy and the local anesthesia. We have a pathologist and a mycologist and a, a, a orbital surgeon. So That's all of us... Sir, please, sorry, maybe I could not clarify the question. My question was, these post-COVID patients, how many of them for COVID, they received home treatment or ICU treatment or they received only oxygen? That is the question. That is so That's what, as, long, as soon as the patient comes, when the patient is diagnosed of a suspected uh, mucus, they don't send back to the home. There is no question of home treatment for these people. Unless these people get debrided, evaluated, and, and they got discharged for a oral antifungal treatment, we don't keep the patient as a home treatment. Uh, okay, sir. And uh, most of these people are post-COVID and... Uh, uh, diabetic who are having a, a steroid treatment, I with or without steroid treatment, even uh, uh, people without COVID 
also as come probably these are all the people they have a very uh, mild covid infection which was not detected or the actually we have, uh, we have presented a paper uh, two years back about 50 patients of mucormycosis and the hidden infection in the pterygopalatine posa so uh, we used to get uh, even prior to covid era we used to get patients of mucormycosis in our hospital because it's at the biggest tertiary hospital in this part of the world uh, so we get lot of patients from uh, andhra karnataka kerala and tamil nadu so we we used to get pe- the patients uh, even before covid but now the patients uh, load is very high and we are having we, we were at one time having about 700 patients of mucormycosis okay uh, the next question to dr shilpi that uh, you have seen lot of cases right so what has been the commonest uh, presenting features in your mucor cases has it been with the typical uh, black discoloration which were the textbook teaching or this time it is something new what what, what was the commonest presentation you have found Dr. Shilpi, can you remove the mask? Your voice is not uh, very well. The most common presenting uh, feature in uh, our patient has been uh, nasal uh, blockage and nasal discharge and headache and especially dental pain. Dental pain uh, has been one of the reasons why these patients have come to us. typically the black turbinates we have not seen as a most common presenting feature in our uh, series okay uh dr shobhan babu sir so uh, is there really any role of diagnostic endoscopy lot of time i have seen people have written normal diagnostic endoscopy and not done the scan and they have come to higher center with a full fledged disease so can you give a message to uh, about this that how much diagnostic endoscopy or a blind biopsy is it really helpful or should we stop doing that no diagnostic endoscopy is the most important uh, investigation <coughs> that you can do once you have uh, the symptoms and suspicion of uh, mucor cases as you know in the nose uh, it's mostly commonly starts from the middle turbinate at the anterior turbinate area so if you can put an endoscope inside and sometimes even on a simple anterior endoscopy you may find a uh, black discoloration of the turbinate or the middle turbinate and all but the endoscope will definitely give you a uh, thorough idea and also you can pick up a uh, bit of a tissue and tell it for histological examination or ko it's more and uh, sinuses is what is the gray area where you cannot see on an endoscope so if you want to see inside the sinuses what the scan says is a mucosal thickening and you want to confirm then you may have to open the sinus and see so you a normal diagnostic nasal endoscopy does not rule out invasive fungal sinusitis okay, okay. Uh, so what we found is there are two types of presentation actually one which starts from the teeth and involving the maxilla another one is it involves the nose and then in turn it involves the maxilla eye and then into the brain so cases where there is alveolar involvement or the maxillary involvement and all if there is obvious findings on the teeth and gums sir then it is easy to diagnose but when there is no obvious findings then you will be do need to do an endoscopy and see if you can find something in the nose or uh, take a biopsy and send it for histology Okay, uh, Doctor Navin, have you found any case which only uh, came to uh, you, not referred from ENT, came to you with some kind of discharging uh, uh, sinus or abscess or dental pain, which you yourself diagnosed as mucor without much nasal symptom, eye pain, headache, nothing? You have to unmute, sir. Doctor Navin, you are muted. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry for that. Okay, yep. Uh, most of the cases which I have encountered directly, I had already had a facial pain, and then uh, had a dental pain, and secondarily, they have got with uh, tooth mobility. Okay, so first thing they have uh, might be having a higher threshold where the facial pain has been uh, subdued by themselves or taking some tablets 
given by some physician or uh, some um, local uh, doctor are uh, not been properly diagnosed whether they have uh, mucor or not so they come with us little late with uh, tooth pain mobility or blackish discoloration in the oral cavity but along with when they come with the blackish discoloration sr formation in the oral uh, cavity either in the palate or uh, in the um, alveolar region so they are usually sick with little bit of fever or something okay so uh, dr ashi uh, what are the uh, commonest eye symptom you saw in the early stages when there is proptosis total ophthalmoplegia it's easy to diagnose but what are the very early and uh, red sign of the eye presentation uh, can you please focus on that yeah thank you for the question dr sampurna so you can hear me right yes uh, the most early stages of mucor mycosis before the eye actually starts showing flagrant symptoms is pain pain which is usually appears to be radiating from the eye but the source of which is in the cheek area or on the lateral wall of the nose which is in conjunction with where the ethmoids are apart from that you can find some amount of swelling over the upper eyelid which can lead to a little bit of mechanical droop giving rise to the picture of ptosis things like ophthalmoplegia can happen in very early stages in a mild form where only in extreme gaze the patient might have double vision so that's an early point to look out for and loss of vision can happen at any stage there are many cases in which in a completely quiet eye with full eye movements the patient has still ended up with no vision at all so there is a broad spectrum but yeah the early signs would be pain paresthesia and the upper eyelid droop right uh next question to dr janki ram sir uh, other than looking at the scan when a patient comes to you are there any prominent clinical features by seeing which you can say okay this patient has extensive calvus involvement what are the other clinical features we should look for i think the patients uh, first of all when you do a diagnostic nasal endoscopy i find that there is a little uh, grayish brown pus even though the inferior turbinate is normal the middle turbinate is normal that grayish brown pus gives me a suspicion of mucor especially post covid number that is i think the most consistent finding in uh, nasal endoscopy that i have seen this is point number 1 Point number two, as we are seeing more and more uh, cases of mucor, mucor uh, is slightly difficult to me. I think I have to analyze all my data. I've still not analyzed. It's uh, actually very sinister disease and doesn't have a particular uh, framework. Like for example, JNA has got a particular framework. It's it's from the uh, pterygoid veins like that. But uh, this mucor has got a very sinister presentation. Uh, Uh, but to answer your question very specifically uh, skull base is a very huge area starting right from the frontal bone till the level of the uh, odontoid uh, this is on the sagittal plane on the coronal plane it extends right from the orbit uh, the base of the orbit till the level of the jugular foramen so it depends upon what uh, place is affected sometimes we find only the frontal bone affected if the frontal bone alone is affected patients present with severe headache uh, in that region and sometimes it can it can also produce a little uh, uh, swelling of the eyelids so sorry am i audible where, where? yes sir yes sir <clears throat> it's very clear okay so from the front, so frontal bone uh, and uh, we, the, the in the frontal bone we have three or four places involved we are trying to map all that we still not got the statistics so we have the lateral part of the frontal bone the superior part of the frontal bone and the uh, supraorbital rim involved in some cases in supraorbital rim there is definitive eye problems and if you go towards the base of the anterior cranial fossa uh, that is the medial part of the anterior cranial fossa can be involved the lateral part of the anterior cranial fossa can be involved if the medial part is involved the patient complains of uh, in invariably anosmia and uh, again headache is one complaint and if the lateral part is involved the eye consistently gets involved 
uh, the eye is swollen up and you might have an extra dural abscess there and uh, causing severe uh, retroorbital pain. When you go to the middle part of the skull base, that is when the posterior ethmoid skull base, the fovea is involved. Again, headache is the consistent feature. But when you go towards the uh, sphenoid, the sphenoid skull base produces severe headache, severe headache. Most of the patients have severe headache. They are very silent. If you look at the middle top right, middle top right is normal. Uh, the, uh, sometimes the maxilla also is normal. Uh, some people say that it starts from the middle top right. Even Shilpi has been telling that. I strongly refute it. We will bring out uh, complete data of what we have seen. Many, many patients, the middle meat has a, uh, we, we don't find any disease. And posteriorly, the disease is there on the sphenoid sinus. The clivus is involved. And such cases, we have seen varied presentations. They present either with a sixth nerve palsy, a third nerve palsy. Uh, uh, you can have a, a superior orbital fissure involved. And so you have a three, four, six palsy. And you have uh, sometimes the uh, thrombos, the carotid artery, producing infarcts everywhere in the, in the skull base. So your patient can present directly with uh, hemiplegia. I've seen patients, patients coming with coma, uh, complete uh, comatose stage. And in fact, uh, we have operated on some patients and totally recovered uh, with abscesses. They come with abscesses. These are all skull base involvements. Uh, just want to tell you that if a skull base is involved, it can actually present very silently initially. This is one point I want to tell you, just with headache. And we will try to neglect it by saying, unless we put our eye and see where the, which part of the skull base is involved, I think we'll have to look into detail from the frontal bone till the level of the odontoid and till the jugular foramen. Anything can, I've seen parapharyngeal space, V3 involvement, V3 causing severe neuralgic pain, fragile neuralgic pain, or we can even see the uh, 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 jugular foramen involved, the seventh nerve palsy, uh, we have seen uh, patients with seventh nerve palsy when the petrous apex bone has been involved. So it's a very varied uh, presentation of uh, uh, mucor. Uh, in fact, I have not exactly got the statistics since we have not tabulated our uh, results. Once we do that, we will definitely come out with this. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shohan Babu said, so when you suspect uh, uh, invasive fungal sinusitis, which is not very prominent on the diagnostic nasal endoscopy, but uh, looking at the CRP level or other features and the history of suspecting strongly, what will you recommend first? Will you write a CTPNS or just an MRI or MRI with contrast? What, what will be uh, your choice? My initial choice would be MRI with contrast. Okay. And do you uh, prefer to see the fat, fat suppressed or do you just uh, see the other sequence, any specific way how you uh, screen the scans? Yeah, depending upon the patient's symptoms, uh, the areas which you need to be specifically concentrating on the commonest presentation being the rhino orbital or the rhino orbital cerebral area. And I've already highlighted by the Dr. Janakira areas of the skull base, everything has to be assessed uh, by the uh, MRI contrast. Right. Uh, so, uh, there are definite advantages of each sequence of MRI as we know, uh, especially uh, the fungal, uh, uh, it Dr. will look Bosch. different. Yes, sir. Dr. Bosch, I want to add here, <clears throat> Yes, sir. Many people actually write only for MRIs. Honestly speaking, MRIs may be just one investigation uh, to pick up the disease. We have three important investigations in our protocol. Having seen a lot of skull base involvement, we have three investigations. In MRI, we have a lot of sequences. We're going to talk about fat suppressed, uh, all that, and then uh, contrast, with contrast, without contrast. But many, many might miss involvement of the bones. So, uh, of course, they say MRI can give you a very good uh, details of the bones. But if you look at the uh, MDCT, uh, multidimensional uh, um, CT, uh, and comb bean CT, that is the uh, CBCT of the palate, we can pick up a lot more lesions. So, I have in my protocol MRI with MDCT with CBCT. Any patient undergoes this because the frontal bone, sometimes see this, you are showing one uh, MRI, this frontal bone, 
uh, 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 you can see a perisinus inflammation. Can you comment whether this frontal bone is involved or not? Honestly, no, you cannot because uh, it's very difficult to say. The, you can say a frontal sinus is involved. I might do a draft, but how do you know the anterior table is involved or not? So in this situation, this your your own case, I might have to see how the anterior table is involved, or the posterior table is involved, or the superior orbit is involved. And for that, I think we should go in for a mandatory MDCT, and that's where we will miss disease. And if you miss disease, what will happen is there will be osteomyelitis, and then the patient will present with an extra dural abscess or a, a, a frontal lobe abscess. Yeah, please carry on. I just Thanks. wanted to add this point. Thanks. So actually, uh, after this, I started putting a couple of cases for the uh, uh, sake of discussion. And in between, uh, whoever wants to add something, please uh, do add because ultimately it's a roundtable discussion. So a uh, couple of case scenarios, yeah, like Sir told about the CT. So I did put a few CT scans for to look into the bony involvement. So this was a, a post-op scan of one of my patient only, where I did first the maxillectomy and uh, maxillotomy and the taking out the part of the uh, lamina papyrosi and then they were doing good but after a few months the some pain was persisting and swelling was there so the repeat CT showed this kind of uh, pterygoid involvement so uh, my question to uh, uh, Dr. Anthony is that when you see this kind of involvement uh, in the pterygoid process what will be your approach there are people who uh, does with a maxillofacial approach that we can do with the endoscopic approach. Uh, how do you approach that? This is endoscopic. Say, so what, what, I, what I generally, my protocol will be, first all the patients go for mega antibody. How far laterally the patient goes will be deciding your anterior approaches, like whether it is a pre-lacrimal approach with a mega antrum or it's a... Uh, uh, modified dental. As far as you go posteriorly, I open a Elga palatine posa from the uh, uh, Elga maxillary repeater, drill the uh, um, orbital uh, uh, orbital process of the, the palatine bone, expose the uh, uh, IMAX, look for the patency of IMAX, then take, uh, clear all the infection from those area. I take biopsy from the uh, blood vessels, if they are partly thrombosed, then you can you can drill the uh, uh, spinal process. You will go to the pterygoid plate. Then I think that that case you have a the pterygoids are all loose, so you just dissect the bone from the uh, attached muscle and you can take it out. Right. Diagram anything else? Diagram, you have muted. Sometimes I have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think uh, you changed the case, uh, previous case or this case. I don't know what. Uh, I mean, the pre you are showing now the second case. No, well, yeah, yeah, I changed. I changed. Sorry, sorry. I will go back there. I the told about the maxill medial maxillectomy. I went to that one. I will go back again once. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Now discussing this case. <coughs> this case is a very interesting case to me. It's a very interesting case. Actually, you look at the uh, uh, you have, uh, whoever has done the first time, they have done a very nice uh, middle medial androstomy. Uh, and then you can see here there is a little uh, thickening here along the inferior orbital rim. So this area is one area I want to address with an MRI. First, I have to see the MRI, whether this area is showing an, uh, a hyperintense or a hypointense area in the T2 uh, fat suppressed image. So this area, but since I have very limited cuts, I can only comment on these three cuts. Now, this second cut, I am sure that this patient is having an involvement of the pterygoid pitch. If you look at it, and the lateral pterygoid plate is completely gone. And if you see the left side, you can see the plane of the muscles. You can see how beautifully the lateral pterygoid mu muscle is seen. The, the temporalis muscle is seen. This is the uh, uh, level of the medial pterygoid muscle. But here you see there is no absolutely mashed up. If you look at the CT itself, you can beautifully get an idea of uh, the complete mashup in the infratemporal fossa. That means I need an MRI, definitely check. And more importantly, look at this. So look at this alveolus. Uh, look at this, uh, uh, if it is not rotated, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, then the palatine bone is almost like, you know, it's, uh, I'm not able to see, but definitely uh, if I had very thin sections, I would 
keenly study this. And then I would, for this patient, see, if you look at the MRI of the VDN now, I don't know how many people have looked into the VDN versus the V2. The VDN is very thick. In all the cases of pterygoid involvement, the VDN nerve looks not, not here. You can't see it here. Uh, it's uh, posterior to it here in this last cut. You can see, but uh, that also has been cut half. Uh, the median nerve is thick. So I have to look at the greater ring of C. I have to go, I have to trace that median nerve till it becomes normal. So this is one area I will concentrate. And since the C naught on the right side is involved, I have to look at the clivus also. So this is the area which is going to be the problem area in this case. And if I don't address it, the patient is going to land up in a recurrence. So these are the intricate points which I will look for. The median nerve, the median lateral pterygoid plate, the palatine uh, bone, and then the mashed up uh, infratemporal fossa. This, in this, the temporal fossa, the base of the temporal fossa looks okay. Uh, the greater ring of looks okay. Uh, in the CT, you can pick it up beautifully. Uh, very nicely you can pick it up and you can see that the marrow space is completely damaged if it is there. Uh, I think this patient might need a, a pterygoid and then look at the orbit this side and of course look at the clivus. So, uh, and also of course the palate, of course the palate. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so the, this case, um, this was also a revision case, uh, but it, the surprisingly, we could never prove this as a mucor. None of the biopsy or any other test came as mucor, but there were bony erosions and other features, diabetic patient, post-COVID, with steroid, all the other history were matching. So on basis of that, we treated with amphobi and we did the surgical debridement also. To my surprise, uh, our uh, microbiology test came positive for pseudomonas. So we had to give, we don't know whether that is a added secondary infection or that is the source, whatever. So we gave both anti-pseudomonal and antifungal drugs and ultimately the patient improved. So my question about the CT is when somebody present with this kind of uh, erosions in the lamina papyracy, so are we going to uh, dissect the whole lamina papyracy or are we going to keep that because the otherwise the soft tissue in the eye in the MRI was not involved because some people think that it's a natural barrier if it is not necros why to remove and some say remove it because the erosions are around so anybody please Jankiam sir or uh, Anthony sir anybody wants to comment even Ashi. Yeah so uh, Dr. Ghosh I'll start with this perhaps. Uh, there is the theoretical risk of uh, new, you know, ways of infectious spread when you remove the lamina papyracea in these cases. But in my short experience in this stint with the second wave, we've seen that wherever we have removed barriers between orbit and sinus, it has never worsened the clinical picture or the prognosis. Because invariably, the lamina papyracea already has multiple congenital foramina multiple venous channels to connect anything within the orbital compartment to the nose. So sparing it or not sparing it is really not going to change the amount of infection that may spread from the sinuses into the orbit. In fact, by removing it, you can actually create a good way in clearing up the medial part or the medial uh, extraconal space of the involved orbit. And I would say actually if the lamina papyracea is necrosed or unhealthy looking, you must absolutely remove those right. parts. Actually, this patient's presenting symptom was loss of color vision and uh, just starting of diplopia. And after removing the lamina, it improved. But even okay. after a few weeks, it started deteriorating. And that time with low dose steroid, the ophthalmologist managed and ultimately he became disease free. Uh, my question to Jankiram sir is that sir, uh, can pseudomonas really cause this kind of destructive feature or has it, it is fungal only? What do you think? See, uh, a little sinister case, very nice uh, sinister case. Number one is that uh, biopsy you have taken and it has not shown euchre. So I just want, this is not only for you, but just for the general public and also for, I mean, the, I'm talking about the doctors. Uh, one thing is amphotericin B is a very, very uh, dangerous drug. It can per se cause a lot of problems. So unless we have documented evidence of mucor or any fungal infection, it is not advisable to start on amphotericin. This is uh, very clear because if the patient goes to court tomorrow 
and if because of a renal failure or something like that and you don't have a definitive uh, uh, you know a, a mucor or any fungal uh, lesion then the, you cannot justify yourself by saying i provisionally started it's not like add or uh, just like that it, it is like you know you have to prove this is very important that there is fungus and only then you can start on amphotericin that is point number 1 point number 2 is uh, uh, i have uh, see pseudomonas uh, can as we know it causes skull based osteomyelitis so we know that uh, malignant otitis externa is caused by pseudomonas it causes extensive destruction of the skull base and uh, it can definitely destroy any of the uh, 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 thin bones uh, so uh, i mean we have seen a lot of skull based osteomyelitis not particularly to the lamina papyracea as such having said that if the patient is post covid in this instance if the patient is post covid and if the patient is uh, um, you know um, diabetic during uh, the uh, this one the covid state then i would definitely suspect mucor only so my first diagnosis again would be mucor i will take a good see this these uh, cells have not been cleared completely i would definitely uh, clear all these cells and then what i would do is uh, as i agree with the oculoplastic surgeon in saying that lamina papyracea is not a big great barrier so i wouldn't uh, recommend preserving it if it is necrosis i would definitely and you can see that it's already eroded in many places i would completely remove that but more importantly the periorbita the see the periosteum the dura the periorbita these are the structures which are barriers but if i suspect that the uh, lamina is uh, completely gone i would remove the lamina and then i would see the color of the periorbita so that gives me a very nice judgment about the disease underlying it of course the mri also will give me a whether the inflamed muscles are there or if there is some necrotic tissue what we have done in several cases uh, if the la uh, lamina has been taken the periorbita is intact we designed on the intraorbital injection of uh, amphot uh, uh, amphotericin that's what my my orbital surgeon does so i think uh, the oculoplastic surgeon can uh, give uh, highlight about intraocular injections but having said that if the lamina uh, is taken off and the periorbita looks very dirty then i would open it and examine inside the orbit and i wouldn't think about a radical debridement i would like to remove assess the orbital apex and things like that but that will be roughly given by the mri so having said that pseudomonas can definitely cause such a disease i agree with you and a very nice sinister case nicely done Yeah, actually, uh, opening up of uh, lamina papyracea, looking inside, all these things will also have an associated eye symptom, right? Patient yeah. will have uh, 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 other symptoms like uh, ingestion, uh, liquid edema, and uh, uh, all these things. And the patient might have a uh, mild proptosis. And if there is uh, muscles, I mean, if there is a orbit involvement is there uh, then you got to do an mri and if there is an extra yeah. ocular movement or uh, or restricted or vision vision there is a problem you got to definitely look into the superior orbital fissure and the cavernous yes so these are all the important thing and uh, when the patient has got absolutely no disease on the on the eye and uh, only if you if you remove the lamina papyracea usually we don't open up the the periorbita uh, periosteum because it's a good barrier but if you see a dirty color and there is a, a minimum proptosis or minimum congestion or, uh, or or any other eye symptom it is it is preferable to make a window and just look in shape uh, take out all the fat which is uh, uh, infected uh, that will improve the patient along with it uh, Uh, into orbital steroid injection. Okay, right. Thank you, sir. Moving to the next slide. Uh, in between, I would like to ask Dr. Shilpi that uh, when you see the uh, scans, do you see the films or do you go to your uh, radiology center and sit down with your radiologist and see all the things in their, uh, you know, radiology room because it makes lot of difference. What is your practice and how does it help? we always have a dipom cd of whatever the mri is we ask patient to get get it done and we always go through the mri because you need sometimes 
area in which you have cavernous sinus involvement or clival involvement or internal carotid artery involvement, you need uh, one millimeter, one millimeter section detail. So in that cases, you, we always get a diform data. And for CBCT, there's always a facial reconstruction uh, CD which the patient carries uh, for future, for any reconstruction uh, process he wants later. So that CBCT of face is always there in a CD format with the patient. Right. So we have been seeing a lot of uh, videos from your hospital in YouTube and Facebook. So I have always thought that uh, use of doctor and all we saw, but uh, do you use navigation, EPS, and I mean, what percentage of cases? Because such complicated cases you perform. For mucomycosis, we, are, we haven't used navigation till date. Okay. Uh, because generally, you follow the disease, even in the cases where we had intracranial spread in the form of abscess, we were able to follow the disease and you can see the dura uh, involved and very uh, friable and you knew that this is the area where the abscess is. So, generally, till date, we have not used navigation anywhere for a mucomycosis case. Okay. okay. Coming back to another case, so this lady uh, with all typical history of COVID, diabetes and steroid intake, uh, presented with severe headache and the MRI showed the sphenoid involvement which looks like only a little bit of mucosal thickening. None of the other sinuses were involved. She also had uh, lateral rectus palsy and uh, retroorbital pain. So I, I did the endoscopic debridement first and uh, all the mucosa sometimes, I mean all, all of us will agree that it doesn't look uh, black at all in the initial stage. It looks many times it looks normal or just for cobblestone appearance. In fact, here it was just a lot of congestion was there like normal infected sphenoid mucosa. But after uh, removing the mucosa in the bones, I could see that these things are sitting here. And uh, so my question here to all of you is when you see this kind of features and the, in the MRI, uh, clival involvement was there in the beginning stage and it was written in the scan report as well. So what should we do? Should we just uh, leave it and start hydrozampoby or should we drill the bone out in the very first surgery or should we wait and watch how the patient is progressing? Dr. Jankiram, Dr. Anthony, anybody will answer please? Anthony, you want to take the case? Uh, I think you need more cuts for this. Okay, I am sorry I didn't put more cuts, but I will tell you it was mentioned in the radiology report that there were cleaval involvement was there, which I which I knew, and I could see this fungus already you know mm -hmm. embedded in the bone. So in that scenario, will you? I will. Clival yeah, involvement. Yeah, yeah, clival. But the patient was, was not very sick. The CRP was not very high. And as you see, only one sign. No, no. When you, when, you, when you suspect a clival involvement, you got to define which part of the clivus it involves. An upper clivus, mid clivus, or lower clivus. Okay. If it's usually a mid clival disease and you have a well pneumatized uh, sphenoid, you, you can always uh, expose the uh, uh, clival with a good exposure and then drill out the bone to an extent you see that normal bone. Otherwise, leaving behind the osteomyotic bone will keep on increasing. And then you got to give an adequate aphorosynthesis. Okay. Uh, John Kiram, sir, will you please... Uh, yeah, so this is my area of interest. This is my area of interest. We have been doing almost every day these cases only. So if you look at this case very carefully, number one, the anterior part of the uh, whole nasal cavity is not involved. If you look at it carefully, even the axials, you can see it is purely a posterior disease. So we are now classifying it like an anterior disease, lateral disease, posterior disease, superior disease, all that we are, we are coming out uh, slowly. It will take some time. Now, if you look at it, it's a very common thing which I'm finding, especially after a few weeks. So my initial cases didn't have all this. Maybe three or four cases we have done initially like this. But nowadays, almost all cases are presenting like this. Almost all cases, I can say. And what happens is, you see, there is an involvement of the sphenoid sinus. Please understand one thing you made, one statement that you might have cobblestone appearance also. 
I have never seen cobblestone appearance with fungus. Very, very rare. It's there. Maybe one or two cases I have seen. But generally, the mucosa looks sort of, you know, flattish. And uh, cobblestone means there's a lot of histamine. So the, the goblet cells are active. But what happens is the mucus destroys all that. And once the mucus destroys all that, it becomes totally flat and a lot of, you know, pus only is there. Or initially it becomes yellow, the whole mucosa looks like a sheet. So if I pull it, I'll come like a bed sheet, it'll come out. Or later it becomes like, you know, dark. That is the last stage, uh, completely necrotic stage. Now, if you look at the sphenoid sinus very carefully, you see here, there is perisinus inflammation. You can see that. This is a perisinus. This is not mucosal thickening. It is perisinus inflammation. There's a lot of difference. In mucosal thickening, you'll have cobblestones. Uh, this, uh, some, yeah, we might have. Uh, react initially you have this kind of you know cobblestone appearance but if you look at this clivus very carefully this clivus is diseased you can have a look beautifully seen in the mri uh, uh, it's a still image and you can see that uh, usually what happens is uh, in, you have to compare uh, between the three things number one is the t2 uh, second is t2 fat suppressed that is a still short tau inversion recovery image and third is the t1 with contrast if you look at it, you will see that the clivus generally contains marrow and it has got fat, so it enhances. But when you have a fat suppressed image, you have a hypotense area. You can see in the middle image, you have a beautiful hypotense area here. So definitely this clivus is diseased. And if you look at the right side compared to the left side, uh, I don't know, maybe this is the left side, right side. Right side, you can see the cavernous sinus involved here. You can see very nicely the cavernous sinus involved. And if you look at the retroclival, retroclival, uh, the keratococlival window, you see that's a carotid artery. This is a clivus. This is a window called the keratococlival window. Look at it very carefully. Can you see my arrow mark? Can you see my arrow mark? I don't know if you can see my arrow mark. No, sir. No, sir. That's not coming. Okay. Okay. Sure, anyway. Sure. Yeah, yeah, though, no, no problem. Just, just uh, see the le uh, the right side disease and look at the left side disease behind the carotid. You find there's a sort of a V-shaped enlargement. You can see there's a little dural enhancement also there. You can see a little dural enhancement there. No, the other one, the other one, the next one. Yeah, yeah. Now you see here. Ah, now here in yeah. the middle image, in the middle. Ah, in the middle image, you see. Ah, correct, correct. That is the region where the sixth nerve goes. So that's exactly the region where the sixth nerve goes. And we have found that area being involved and also the sixth nerve palsy in at least six, seven cases now. And you can see the dural enhancement. Can you all appreciate dural enhancement here? You put your, uh, ah, see that, ah, just, just lateral, ah, yes, exactly. So you have to clear this area or else you will not have even a 1% chance of a sixth nerve recovery. Point number one. Number two is uh, whether he recovers or not, this patient is likely to develop, develop an abscess. He might develop a temporal lobe abscess. If you leave it, 100% he's going to have an abscess later. So this is the area where I always say mucor is a clear-cut skull-based surgeon. So it's, it's a skull-based surgery. You have to clear this uh, canticoclival window. You have to clear the petrous apex. This is the petrous apex. This is, a, this is a, called a transpetrous approach. So you do a transmitters approach, you remove the clivus. Usually what we have seen, only th two cases we have seen lower clivus being involved. All of the cases, the mid clivus is involved. The upper clivus is involved very rarely. Of course, uh, in the dorsum, dorsum, I did a pituitary transposition in one case and removed the dorsum also. The dorsum was involved in that case, but it's very rare. The mid clivus is between the carotid is completely involved in most of the cases. And these patients present with persisting headache. They have persisting headache. And when we leave it, I have left some patients initially and what happened, they came back with abscesses. So this is one thing, a very important thing which all the mucor surgeons should understand. Unless you clear this area of the clivus and the keratococlival window, uh, you might land up with a patient coming back with a persistent headache and progressive nerve palsies. And of course, the neurosurgeons, if you ask them, they'll say, okay, leave it boss, let us observe. Yeah, you can observe. Of course, you can observe. You can wait and observe. Uh, but if the patients, if the patients develop progressive pain, he's not going to be happy. If you operate on this, just the sphenoid and just come out, and if the patient is still saying, uh, "Oh, I have uh, severe," this produces severe pain. Uh, sometimes early stage they are asymptomatic. In fact, I did one case around three uh, days back. I think I put it live also. It was a minimal involvement of the clivus, and he didn't have much pain. 
but uh, when you leave it what happens is slowly progresses there is a massive osteomyelitis of the bone and then the patient starts developing severe pain at that stage already it progresses so this is the stage you have to clear this is my answer to your question thank you sir yeah so uh, yeah this is the same patient one month post of uh, scan i am showing you uh, surprisingly even i didn't drill the cleavage the, the way you are telling because i was not well equipped and confident to do that and more than that my neurosurgeon said a big no uh, that's why i didn't do and uh, the patient's uh, headache and symptoms are all gone now and the lateral rectus palsy is also improving according to the ophthalmologist and what i saw but uh, when i do the check endoscopy through the sphenoid i can see at places i can see the dural pulsation uh, patient is afebrile no headache nothing but the crp has still not become normal from the level of 100 it is around 30 34 and it is hovering around that level and at that point this is the repeat scan so there are a lot of uh, osteolytic lesions not only in the clivus now it is going towards the petrous apex as well and the new lot of neurosurgeons opinion taken here all of them are like no go conservative uh, so that's the area of dilemma you can also see at places the skull base is eroded the pituitary is naked there are 2 to 3 mm gaps in places but there is no csa primary and patient also doesn't want another surgery she says i'm doing good so <laughs> how to uh, what to do in these cases how to tackle and what prognosis and realistic expectation i should give them you want me to answer this question yes sir first of all yes, the mri is also there if you want to yeah yeah uh, i mean uh, you can put the mri but before that oh, i no, sorry, sorry. mri yeah, maybe i didn't include in the ppt it, it may be elsewhere again i have put the ct uh, few cuts just to show the uh, skull base here i have marked here and here with the green yeah. arrows see i want to tell you that clivus is a area a dark area okay for the neurosurgeons neurosurgeons can't approach the clivus at all i am because i have been training neurosurgeons for ages now and uh, a clivus is the domain of a skull base surgeon of course a neurosurgeon should turn into a skull base surgeon to approach the clivus and it's a midline structure and it in between the carotid arteries so only a skull base surgeon can do a good job here so of course if you ask the neurosurgeon they'll say only no because they can't go with the only approach is the far lateral they'll do a far lateral and that too it's since it is totally in the bone it, it's almost inaccessible unless they do a transparatal approach they do a, a sort of you know even transparatal approach it's very difficult or they can only approach till here you can't go right till the level of the uh, mid clivus so this area is purely a domain of the skull base surgeon point number 1 so that's why when you ask them they'll say no only number 2 is what is the patient's expectation so you have to clearly get it in written that they don't want the surgery because tomorrow you should not be uh, taken uh, uh, because if the patient worsens then he will say doctor didn't suggest surgery so get it in written that i have suggested surgery but i don't want surgery so the the patient should give it in written that you have suggested surgery that is the way you can escape you always think of a patient like a potential litigant number 3 is that this patient might appear normal today today he might appear normal but you don't know one month two months down the line he will start developing severe pain he will develop lower cranial nerve palsies and of course uh, see already the you, see the patients never present with csf leaks patients never present with csf leak you, even if you have a dural palsy dura is very thick and at the level of the pituitary you will never have a csf leak you might have it at the level of the uh, fovea or maybe the planum even there the dura is thick so you might have not have a, a csf leak but the patient is likely to develop intracranial complications so this patient in my opinion will have on the later date see the clivus completely eroded you have to operate you have in my opinion i will put my hands on and say you have to operate but if the patient doesn't want surgery get it in written that i do not want surgery i have suggested surgery but you have refused the surgery so that you are escaping it the patient might become normal you never know i mean uh, nothing is now by science this patient has got problems by science you should operate but i mean there are some things beyond science i have seen patients uh, having worse uh, skull base osteomyelitis still surviving uh, for many months 
so that is uh, up to you and you have to clearly make your slate clear this is what i want to tell right thank you thank you sir uh, so this is an interesting case also of a young lady uh, post covid no diabetes 24 years old lady uh, just had a uh, oral steroid for few days and then she was having constant discharge from the uh, gingivolabial sulcus which was not detected uh, and some dental procedure was going on even maxillary sinus uh, mucosa was sent for biopsy mucor was not detected pcr was done pcr detected the mucor and uh, so when the, i think dr navin uh, has seen this case so uh, we did the ct with 3d reconstruction and this was the lesion there was no other symptom but discharge from the gum and loosening of the tooth and as this part of the bone was resected and sent for biopsy so the bony biopsy actually came positive followed that one week of amphobi and now on posaconazole and the patient is doing great so my question to dr navin is uh, can you give a, a precise take home message for the ent and also for the dentist that in these kind of cases uh, young and no much symptom what should be the investigation of choice and what was the reason for delay how the dentist missed and maybe it she could not have lost so much of bone if we could have done it much before and what will be your uh, kind of approach right um yeah dr sampan actually we have seen the case um this is a young female actually very pity to see a young female having this good uh, this big lesion uh, maybe around uh, unmarried and uh, looking for a uh, looking out for her mother right uh, she was uh, yes interestingly <laughs> i treated her mother for mucor and uh, she was taking care of the mother and that time she just casually told me i have this kind of discharge and then we picked it up yes so what i have seen in this uh, this second wave search uh, of mucor mycosis one thing which i could see is um, most of the lesion has been left out in the medial uh, anterior medial side of the maxillary sinus so either it could be um, unawareness of the surgeon was treating or uh, he might have missed out because could not clear away the mucosal lining of the maxillary sinus in that area or uh, i could say that there could be some nidus which is already there which has been missed out um so what i would suggest is uh, like whenever a surgery first surgery is done uh, by ent colleague so i would always recommend to flush out or clean the area in the med medial side also see have a good visibility if you could not do it uh, then have a good uh, callulex surgery and clear away all the mucosal lining so what i have seen is most of the like uh, i have been working with almost 8 to 9 uh, ent surgeons in um, uh, in this um, this uh, mucor mycosis uh, uh, this two months uh, they have initial stages they have not done uh, medial maxillectomy not flushed out the nasal lateral of the uh, nose uh, to the into the maxillary sinus so there's small amount of nidus which has been uh, left out in the uh, on the medial side so that has uh, uh, descended down and involved the maxillary uh, alveolar bone whole of the medullary bone is getting involved and it is crossing it is going posteriorly and involving whole of the teeth segment of the teeth mm -hmm. and second thing which i have observed is there's some septa in the maxillary sinus which has been not properly observed so if we leave the disease in the sinus lining around or the behind the septa so that is also causing a nidus and uh, developing an uh, alveolar bone uh, osteomyelitis and then slowly getting into and what i have seen is most of the cases uh, this dental uh, or um, the alveolar mucosa has been not checked before so the alveolar mucosa is usually what happens when the patient comes to us with the clinical sign what we see is the swelling in the alveolar uh, attached gingiva like what we divide uh, the gingiva as free gingiva attached gingiva and the loose mucobuccal fold so there will be usually a small swelling in the attached gingiva without involving the uh, marginal gingiva so if you see any edema you should always suspect that uh, the there could be an osteomyelitis or osteonecrosis of the maxilla in the alveolar region so what i do see is when the patient comes with this like this 
I do along with an ENT surgeon. They do clear off all the um, macular sinus lining along with the medial maxillectomy. And if I suspect there is some uh, lesion, I extract a tooth, maybe the second premolar, or the first premolar, in that region, and check whether the teeth alder bone is involved or not. If the alder bone is involved, I just clear off all of the uh, alder bone so that the patient will not land up into more morbidity in the secondary case. Yes. And uh, regarding the diagnostic uh, thing, as Dr. Uh, Janke Ramsar has told, that along with an MRI, I usually suggest a three-dimensional CT scan, and uh, which shows a good sequestrum in most of the cases. Uh, we can have a good sequestrum and uh, enlargement of uh, the uh, trabeculae. If there is some trabecular enlargement, we all we should suspect that is an involvement in the alveolar uh, bone of the maxilla. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, but uh, my take home message in this because I know the previous ENT surgeon also. So I know okay. that he must have taken out the whole mucosa and sent the proper sample. But I, right. and this is not the only one case, right? You have seen another couple of cases of mine, young people detected like this. So what I understood, sometimes mucosal biopsy comes negative, whereas the bony biopsy when we send it comes positive so we should have a very low threshold of uh, high threshold of suspicion and low threshold to take out the bone we should not think twice if there is even one percent chance it's better to take out bone and the part of the bone to send a sample so that is it uh, uh, what i've seen is should always be treated aggressively. There's no yes, other way to approach. Right. Yeah. Nowadays, I call uh, Dr. Navin sometime whenever, while I am all like Dr. Anthony said, we are doing uh, pre lacrimal approach quite a lot. And if by doing that, when I see the floor of the uh, maxillary sinus, if it looks unhealthy or the bone is not bleeding, so then and there I call Dr. Navin and we finish it off in, in the same sitting. So there is no again and again doing the surgery. Like this case, um, this was a case like lower segment involvement only. There was nothing in the ethmoid, sphenoid, only the maxillary bone. And there was a discharging sinus in the midline of the heart palate. And that is why we intervened and uh, Dr. Navin did a beautiful job, bilateral uh, inferior maxillectomy. And uh, he is completely out of the disease now. So maxilla involvement, probably the prognosis is much better. Like what Jankiram sir said that the skull base involvement, they look silent initially but they keep on dragging the disease and that becomes really, really bad. In uh, This is the post of MRI you can see here. Uh, it is completely disease-free now and uh, the uh, cavity is also con contracting uh, and becoming uh, smaller day by day. And there is no uh, wound dehiscence. The flap was nicely taken. This was not involved, so it was preserved. My question, another question to Dr. Naveen that uh, because as I keep telling you, I have worked with other maxillofacial people also. And taking out both the bone, some de bone dehiscence usually happen. But in your cases, I have seen it is always taken up beautifully without any bony support. So what is your trick of uh, suturing these layers or what extra you do that the whole palatal mucosa nicely, you know, it, it remained there. There was no leakage, no fistula, nothing. Uh Actually, um, many of the cases uh, do heal up very nicely, but some cases we might have a little bit of opening the posterior region, maybe around uh, in seven uh, or we what call in the first and second molar region. We have some uh, cases, very few cases, but what I do is I try to preserve as much mucosa as possible. Like while giving an incision, what I do is I give a crevicular incision, which most of the people might not be giving it. So they remove, um, remove whole of the attached gingiva also where uh, there could be a deficiency in the mucosa. So that thing which I've observed. And secondly, I give a horizontal matter sutures so that uh, the edges are nicely um, uh, come together. There will not be an inversion of the flaps. So that uh, if we can take care, the simple basics of suturing, uh, hopefully there's no oriental communication. So that's the only simple, that's not a magic, it's a simple basics. I have a question to uh, Dr. Nabi. Yes, sir. See, uh, in cases where mucor is involved or involving the palate, you have yes. a problem with the bone, you have some osteomyelitis, some sequest from the pre right. various parts of the palate are involved. For us, it's morely, uh, more anterior, yeah, pre maxilla, pre maxilla, more involvement. Now, the thing is, uh, more and more we have been doing IMAX ligations. 
Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we will do it. There's some crosstalk. Hi, Lilia. Hello? We can hear you, yes. sir. Can you, can, can, you, you, yes. can you mute? Uh, there are some people. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I can hear you, sir. Yeah. So what happens is that we are doing a lot of IMAX like this. Hello? Sir, I can... Yep. Yeah, we do a lot of IMAX ligations or if the infratemporal force are level 2, level 3 are involved, then the IMAX gets thrombosed. Now, uh, have you observed on long term when the palate is normal in the initial surgery, but when you ligate the IMAX, is it going for avascular necrosis or is it the mucor involving the palate? So what is your comment? Uh, what is the blood supply uh, which uh, we have to preserve? Uh, or if the blood supply is hampered by the mucor, uh, will the palate also go off? So have you done a study of intratemporal fossa involvement along with the palate? This is my question to you. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, in this two months, sir, actually, maybe in 15, 16 years, I have not operated a case of mucor mycosis because we have not uh, come across. Uh, in this two months, maybe I have operated around uh, 50 plus resections. But um, I even I have, uh, there are some cases with infratemporal um, involvement. How, how many of your 50 cases you've sir. seen uh, the palate is involved in all the 50? Okay. No, 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 but not not exactly. Not exactly. So Maybe around... cases, right? Yes. So, uh, yep. so in, in most of the cases, uh, what I have seen, like we have uh, uh, even ligated or cauterized the greater uh, palate and artery. Okay. So we had a good supply from the posterior part of the pharynx. Uh, so we didn't have any uh, necrosis after the suturing. Never the wound bro has broken down. And um, there's no necrosis after suturing, complete uh, healing. So what I do is while... Um, uh, while, when, when I start doing the suturing, I remove whole of the granulation tissue of the palate and also the uh, mucosal region. So when you remove the whole of the granulation tissue, that uh, the healing is very, very much comfortable and very much nice. Yeah. I never I come across any of the necrosis in the tip or the, uh, the edges of the mucosa. Never, never happened. To no, no, I'm not talking about the mucosa. Yeah. See, uh, another thing, not only about the greater palate and artery. Yeah. Hello, there's some? Yes, yes, yes. I could hear you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Now, actually, the third part of the IMAX gives off the posterior superior alveolar artery and yes, the greater palate and artery. Both supply the palate. Okay. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the anterior part of the palate, a little bit by the uh, uh, superior labial artery, which is a branch of the facial artery. Right. Right? So, a yes, little bit yes. of the facial artery supplies it. But what happens is right. that we ligate the third part of the IMAX because the third part of the greater part of the artery, one artery is okay. Posterior superior artery right. is also gone. So if I ligate yes. the third part of the IMAX, all the disease has uh, destroyed it. Uh, and the palate right. still looks, I'm talking only about the bone. I'm not talking, maybe the mucosa may be spared because of cross circulation. I'm not very sure about that. I've still not yes. done a study on that. But what I am asking right. you is what will happen to the bone, only the bone, if the right. bone is normal during the first stage and how many you have had to revise, I mean, I'm asking about the ENT surgeons have to revise because I have revised right. now 10 cases. 10 mm -hmm. of my cases I have revised and all the 10, what we have done is we have uh, the patient had... Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, we have had involvement of the infratemporal force now, uh, level 2, level 3. Right. And at the stage of the first surgery, the palate, uh, bone was normal. And then when the patient came back, the patient had a necrosis of the bone. The mucosa was a little bulging. There was no um, right. you know, discoloration as such, no necrosis. So what's your comment? Yes. On? Right, very true. What you said is very true. Like I had come across only one case where the surgery was done, but um, the bone was involved. The bone is completely necrosed till that half of the uh, maxilla. There was a partial maxillectomy done along with the, um, maybe it was done somewhere else actually. So once the blood supply is cut, the bone also, that side, uh, half of the maxilla is getting necrosed. 
So what I am doing in these cases, I have completely removing whole half of the maxilla. On that side, where the involvement is there, so so that uh, uh, there will not be um, secondary uh, surgery which is required. But not many, maybe couple of cases I observed, uh, not many. Hmm. Okay, the the mucosa. Hello. Yes, sir. The mucosa. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is its blood supply from the periosteum, right? This mucosa receives its blood right, supply sir. from the periosteum as well as from the artery. So when we are removing the from bone, the when yes, we are yes. removing the bone along with the periosteum, and we right. take off the granulation from superior part of the palate, that is from the nasal aspect. And of course, if the uh, artery uh, is ligated there uh, by right. doing a dentures, we ligate yes. the artery. What will be the status of this mucosa? How will it survive? It will have a carcinogenic. I'm asking about a long run. Yep. yep. Uh, it will have a good amount of cross innervation, sir. Nothing usually usually happens. It will uh, nicely survive. The mucosa usually survives because that is the beauty of the facial skeleton and the facial muscles and facial mucosa, or facial uh, facial region that we have a lot of uh, anastomosis. So that usually survives. The soft tissue survives nicely, comfortably. This Without much of damage. This is, all, this is what we have also seen that the mucosa yes. survives. So I just wanted to yes. ask you how. I mean, it's uh, very nice that we have a lot of cross circulation, and when we preserve the mucosa, it survives. A very nice point. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ghosh, carry on. I was asking, should I continue the cases, a few more case scenarios, or you want to take the videos and Dr. Anthony sir, whatever you say, all of you, I will go accordingly. Couple of more we'll, cases. We'll take the video of uh, uh, Anthony, okay. of Anthony, and then we'll take it from there if we have time. Okay. Dr. Anthony, I will stop the screen sharing, Aditi, or you will. You will have to stop the screen sharing okay. and so you have to take over. Yes, yes, yes. I'm doing that. Done. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. So, so basically, this is about a, a frontal lobe abscesses. Uh, the mucor disease is usually uh, when it occurs. Based upon three arteries, one is an anterior ethmoid artery, as well as the sphenopalatine artery, which is the, the posterior branch, the, the posterior septal artery. So, if these arteries are the the main arteries which is started this disease, uh, the disease can ascend uh, to the midline, can destroy septum and go to an opposite side and involve the anterior skull base. Anterior skull base is the region is from the uh, So what happens is, can you see the video? So basically, whenever there is a skull base osteomyelitis, the disease can cause the inflammation of the uh, endosteal layer of the dura, which can spread inside, like how the infection of the uh, 
massage spread inside the temporal uh, temporal bone similarly it can have a stalk like an abscess or an abscess which has got comes very close to the dura uh, in the anterior cranial fossa so you have the layers of the bone and the dural layer and then the brain matter so uh, infection can easily go to the the dura and without breaking the dura it can travel it can go inside and can produce brain abscess so the disease can be a nephrological disease or a spinal disease a nephrological disease will have a cerebrum plate involvement it's a calvus osteomyelitis it can produce extradural abscess or a brain abscess while the spinal disease is a uh, it can cause a cavernous sinus thrombosis intracranial artery occlusion and a multi uh, multiple or diffuse venous involvement and the temporal lobe abscess so uh, when you take a ct scan uh, the ct scan alone is very deceptive while when you when you take an mri mri will give you a good idea about cerebritis and the abscess but it doesn't give you any information about the bone so you got to take both mri and the and the ct scan for all these patients so you can see usually the frontal lobe abscess or the um, uh, bilobe so even it starts from the right nostril it can involve both the both the lobes of the brain it it produces nice heart in shape low symbol but it's not such a such a disease um, so uh, this is an another patient where they have a single large abscess involve one the uh a right side of the of the patient nostril this this disease is got a midline disease which destroys the uh, all of a of a septum it was a, a, a revision case when you do the surgery for the primary part and leave the osteomyelitis it can become a brain abscess like this and this is the third case where there is a uh, it's also a, a, a revision case and you can see the abscess in the frontal lobe so there are lot of the lot of cases of frontal lobe abscess are there when you give a good amount of uh, uh, when you ask a, a neurosurgeon this these abscess are all far off from the surface so when you want to drain these abscess you got to do a bicoronal incision and you got to lift the frontal lobe and then you got to drain these abscess which the, the neurosurgeons are uh, not very comfortable with so they they will they will advise if you can drain the abscess they advise you to drain the abscess or they will keep the patient as an uh, uh, observation as janakram said uh, whenever there is a clival work they prefer to keep it as a observation than uh, directly going inside the work state But similarly a frontal lobe abscess usually they don't drain so if it's possible they ask you to drain through the anterior transcapital form of course so first what we do is we uh, you got to identify the uh, sinus sinus because the planum is the posterior most limit of your anterior cranial fossa and then you do a uh, you identify the frontal sinus from there you will see the anterior fovea from the fovea to the planum is your anterior skull base so you, are, you define the skull base and then remove the middle turbinate if there is a bilateral disease you got to remove the part of septum also and then once you have uh, once you have removed that you you locate that to be from plate the radiologically you got to map the disease with your ct scan and the mri to look up probably at which level these uh, uh, frontal lobe abscess will be there so you you got to first debride the olfactory fibers then remove the bone once you have removed the bone
you need to select that uh, first option, screen option, while sharing your screen. So you got to define that salvage. Uh, so this is a, a division case. So you you look for the bone and then drill the bone uh, from this side to be formed like to the opposite side that can be formed drill the bone and then once you have drilled the bone so this this the the peep, uh, this patient that underwent uh, uh, medial orbitotomy so once you have removed the bone uh, Once you remove the bone, uh, then you got to identify the uh, the meninges, remove the excess meninges, palpate for the weak point, and if needed, you got to aspirate and uh, uh, then puncture the dura. And then once you know where the abscess is, then you can cut the uh, meninges. Cut the meninges. You can see it is a well organized pus because it's a revision case. For all these people, you have a small amount of CSF which will, which will come out because the, the abscess cavity is open. So once the abscess cavity collapses, the CSF will stop. So it is uh, infected meninges are, are debrided and then cut. Then inside, you keep a, a gel foam and then slowly take out all the wall. But actually, we you see that you don't see the... Uh, you aspirate and see. Once you have aspirated and, and confirm pus is there, this is a page, this is a pus case. What I, what I showed you that the hot in like a pus, it was draining. Uh, you can see a large amount of pus was gushing out. And then. Uh, the video is gone again, sir. We could see the drainage. Now it is not showing again. You are not able to see the, see the video? Not now exactly, till uh, yeah, one minute. minutes before we saw it. So do you flush the cavity with uh, amphobia or anything like that? Yes, yes, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that, we'll come to that. So this is the dura, and then we aspirate the dura. So I have aspirated pus, and then we want to aspirate the pus. You just remove it. This much amount of pus you keep on giving amphotericin B is not going to uh, help you. Right, sir. So now you can you can divide all the meninges are around it, and the cavity comes smaller. And actually, we use, we don't see the uh, uh, classical wall like how you see on a the pyogenic axis. What we have seen is like a slimy layer of fluff, and uh, uh, you keep a, a small piece of gel foam, and then. Um, How 
how was the long term uh, prognosis sir did how are these patients after the drainage patient, and all within 2 3 days they they will improve uh and you give a see this is a patient where we have a uh infected bone which is removed and then we are looking for a place where uh, there is a dehiscence and once you identify the dehiscence place the the uh, pus will start gushing you remove the cubic form plate and identify uh, that not not coming, sir the video again not coming Is is it coming now? Yes, yes, sir. Very clear. actually this new bar mycosis has given us a, a great chance of doing cell based surgeries more often before that even though we are uh, wanted to become a cell based surgeon the chances and getting cases were all uh, not uh, that much higher and uh, the uh, acceptance of neurosurgery is uh, very less but now uh, the acceptance of neurosurgery is great so there is no sir how do you point the exact uh, from where you will enter the abscess how do you mark That's that well. can it by seeing the scan or you in or intraoperative just following the disease how do you locate that particular point which so actually uh, when you when you look at the one minute i'm just asking the other panelists why you are trying to open up sir so uh, yeah yeah so uh, brain abscess was drain uh, in our center initially the patient was doing well but after couple of weeks they developed cva so all of oh. you how many of you have seen lot of cva uh, post op or on the table or while recovery the actually for the first question how do you to point out the place when yes. you see the ct scan and an mri you know where it is very close to which part of the um, anterior fossa whether it is anterior or posterior in response to the um, usually all these cases that anterior femoral artery is uh, obliterated so uh, on a ct scan identify an anterior femoral artery and how close it to that and uh, which side it is closer that you can identify that will be uh, uh, confirmed with that of your mri where uh, the the relationship of the tall and the if it is not possible then what you do is you remove the whole of the dura see you open up the subfrontal uh, system and look for the uh, for the brain matters and then you will see the uh, you can uh, slowly poke with your uh, 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 ball probe to find out the uh, first pointing area okay but the problem with that is that you you need a defect got to be closed if you are opening up the dura at that point where it is very close then you need not open it instead of opening it you can uh, uh, you need not close the cavity also you can just fill the cavity with the with the gel foam so this is the a question for dr shilpi dr shilpi will you always prepare the thigh for such cases like you may need uh, i mean for the reconstruction do you prefer to always keep it prepared yeah for cases in which we expect gross uh, frontal involvement if sir is going for uh, 
draft procedures, gross uh, cribriform area involvement, and uh, gross pelvis involvement will always have the thigh prepared. At least we'll have fascia or hadar flap to cover the defects so that we can uh, uh, prevent the spread of the infection uh, forming a barrier between the dura and the nasal cavity. Especially if frontal is involved and cross scalp is involved, we have also we have gone for uh, we have done pericranial flaps also to cover the okay. whole scalp base and try to form a barrier between the scalp base and the nose. So you will shave the hairs also. We'll keep that also ready. Yeah, and this is in which we are doing all a draft frontal, and we expect the posterior table of the frontal sinus or gross cribriform involvement, maybe unilateral, bilateral. In these cases, we keep the pericranial also. Anthony sir, uh, you are sharing another video. Yes. Uh, These are heroic surgery, sir. I mean, did, did this patient survive, sir? How many months follow up? See, this whole mucormycosis is only two months duration, right? So that's the follow up yes. we have. We have done about seven, eight cases of frontal lobe uh, drainage, and uh, uh, how is their quality of life? I mean, their. Uh, Movement and uh, IQ level. I mean, because frontal, no, I'm just thinking in that way. They're, they're doing well, and Jankiram sir also can tell because you have done so many temporal abscess and frontal. How do they do after the surgery? Actually, actually uh, after uh, Anthony finishes, I can give a comment on uh, abscesses in the brain because we have uh, now, I think, 16 cases. We have operated on both temporal and frontal lobe, 16 cases. And I will give you a summary of what we have done. Right, sir. After he finishes, I will tell you. Right. Uh, Dr. Anthony, do you take your neurosurgeon also do, during doing these cases? I, they have time, they will come. If they don't have time, they might not come also. Uh, right. But I am in a tertiary hospital where we have a seven neurosurgical unit and every day somebody will be there. If you call for an help, they will come. They'll be in that uh, nearby place only. Okay. Uh, so that won't be the problem. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anthony, uh, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Anthony, Dr. These are all revision cases, sir. Sorry? These are all revision cases, sir. Uh, most of them are revision cases. I have done few uh, uh, state cases also. I mean, uh, uh, primary cases also. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, primary cases is that uh, And what do you think is the main factor that, that they developed this? Is the first surgery was not good enough or they didn't receive no, no, no. to the family? Oh, when we, uh, we it all started like this. When we started, there is a lot of cases. And uh, we used to do about 20 cases a day. So uh, all these cases, we got a, a neurosurgical opinion. And all these neurosurgical, all these patients, primarily, they thought uh, uh, we can wait. So they, they they put a patient on uh, amphotericin B and they said it produces more morbidity in uh, in draining the patient. And then once uh, we showed them it is very close to the anterior sulfate, then they said if you want you drain, we will be with that. That the gushing uh, first case was that the first case. So when I did that first case, they got so uh, so happy that uh, they sent all the cases to us. They oh. said better you be better you do because. Newer mycosis doesn't kindle their uh, their interest. Yeah, uh, yeah. Except the ENT surgeon, least, except the ENT surgeon in a in, in a government setup to an extent, uh, 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 ophthalmologist, all others see it as a sort of burden. For example, if you have a skin involvement, excise all the skin and call for a plastic surgeon. They say, okay, discharge the patient, send for a, a secondary closure, things like that. So they don't jump upon that. Except that ENT surgeon. So, Nobody is jumping upon the private practice that's different, right? So, no, private also neurosurgeons are least interested in mucor cases. 
Sir, first thing they will say is try oh, amputation. <laughs> first thing they say is try amputation, and then they will say you won't get amputation, and so it will get, it will get prolonged. So yes. after that, see, what I actually do is I put a gel foam, see, uh, put a gel foam, clean that cavity. So they every uh, they said that uh, after cavity, after you have a capsule and you got to remove the capsule. But uh, these fungal cases, I don't find much of a big capsule. We got to be sealed off or things like that. Uh, so we keep a gel foam to just rub. After that, take a diluted amphotericin B, uh, put it inside the, the inside the cavity and just wash it. Once you have you have washed it completely, then uh, depends upon if there's a leak or not. There is no no leak. We we keep a sandwich. Take a surgery uh, cell, keep some uh, gel foam inside, roll it and keep it inside and see the defect. What happens? If there is a, a persistent defect. The the cases I I have packed with. Uh, uh, if I if I suspected a case of leak, I pack it with the uh, fat, put a special letter uh, inner lay and another special letter on on overlay. Uh, that patient had a uh part of a septum left behind so we took uh -huh. other flap and kept it there and we used the tissue glue in all stages okay. so you uh, dr shohan babu sir because sir is also heading in our medical college and you are hod so uh, did you guess uh, this many of uh, brain abscess sir and how did you deal with that we have a team of uh... We have a team of uh, doctors, and uh, each uh, one deals uh, in its own uh, area. So we have an oculoplasty surgeon, you have a facial maxillary surgeon, you have an ENT surgeon, <coughs> then you have a neurosurgeon involved. So all of them have their own individual areas of operation. So my only observation is uh, these cases are uh, uh, cases which are uh, rare. Which you have not seen uh, so many in the past. Of late, this has been an epidemic of mucor mycosis. So, in our hospital, we had nearly 1240 cases admitted in the hospital, and of which uh, we had operated nearly 690 cases. And uh, involvement of uh, the dental and. Let's uh, switch uh, on your video, please. Hello? Let's switch on your video. You are audible. No, very no, well I am not giving any video. I am just no, no, your... uh, speaking. Okay. So I am not, not giving any video. No, no, sir. Your no, video, no. we can't see your face. No, I... Oh, oh, oh sorry. Not presentation, video. Sorry, sir. Yes, now you are so, visible. The thing is, uh, uh, I would uh, first uh, would like uh, Dr. Dhanikiram to finish this uh, uh, thing about the frontal uh, law. Then I will talk about my experience. That would be better in continuation. Okay. Don't you think? Yes. Now, uh, answer, you would like to use <clears throat> Now, uh, uh, Anthony has finished. Huh? Anthony, have you finished? I, I, I have a problem with this screen sharing and. Uh... Why? Share your screen, boss. Hmm. Open with the VLC boss. Can you see the video now? Yes, sir. Oh. Yeah.
So putting fat in the abscess cavity. Yeah, fat in the cavity. And then uh, use the patient later. These are all the things we all very care to push the skull base, brain, and uh, take the sharp instruments inside. Uh, put another layer, layer overlay. This was our first case, so we are very scared. Uh, to close, and then we we understood that it's not all that uh, important to close the cavity because you you just flush it, you just pack the cavity, and uh, keep a keep a fascia later inside that stop. Is that T cell, sir? You are showing. Then keep a gel foam and surgery cell. On top of the keeper in gel foam and then uh, come out. Uh, Do you see the video? We are seeing the list of videos. Are you playing one of them? No, no, no. I am playing a video. No, one more time. What is the skull base bar you are using, sir, in the video? Sorry? What, what kind of skull base drill you are using in the video? First video you are showing drilling the skull base. What? The skull base drilling, what, what do you use? Drill. Uh, in, uh, neuro drill from Carl Stokes, and we have a bayonet. So, this is inside the cavity. You can just, just wipe out all the uh, uh, stuff like material. There is no actually a true, true capsule thing. Uh, This is another case. Sorry, pain. So uh, there are extradural abscesses. There are abscesses which, which, uh, which are communicating with the, the, the cavity, which are stalled, and a non-communicating abscess, that is the abscess is completely inside that brain substance itself, and there is a normal brain in between. And then abscess can be a tense abscess, like what we have we opened up that first abscess, and or it can be an organized abscess where you can open up, you can go see inside, you can see that capsule. There is no true capsule as far as we have seen, all the seven cases. The, the capsule is only a, a, a capsule is a, a, a pseudo capsule which can be just wiped out with a gel foam. Filling the capsule and uh, managing the defects according to the uh, defects what we see. So thank you very much. Uh, hello. Thank you so much, sir. Very nice videos and 
so many cases you have done okay Dan, sir will you share your videos now will you start sir no you are asking me sir you are Oh, okay, okay, okay. Actually, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate uh, Professor Anthony uh, for this wonderful work in Madras Medical College. Actually, uh, this is uh, my alumni. I studied in MMC, and uh, Anthony, Professor Anthony, is my classmate. I'm so proud of him that he has done the maximum number of uh, brain abscess in uh, our college, and I'm so happy and proud. Uh, uh, of him and his wonderful videos, beautiful videos and reconstruction. Uh, congratulations, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, what I am going to do is I am just going to I may not be able to because it's already late. I don't want to share my screen and uh, show you some videos. I'll just uh, give some comments on how we deal with uh, brain abscess. Um, hello. Sir, please. Okay. Number one is uh, when a patient comes with a, a brain abscess. Uh, the usually what we have seen is either it comes in the frontal lobe or in the temporal lobe. This is point number one. And these patients generally walk in; they don't have any uh, massive deficits. So because the frontal lobe also is a very benign area. And the temporal lobes also is a very benign area, so we can resect uh, that area in the basi temporal region. Doesn't have any much uh, important zones. Same way in the frontal lobe also. So they walk inside. Um, so once they come, first of all we do a MRI. In MRI, you will find that in a T2 FS, uh, it actually shows areas of gliosis. In T2, you will have a lot of areas of gliosis, and that is not an abscess actually. So, what is the investigation of choice for a patient with abscess, brain abscess? It is a T1 with contrast. So, a contrast will give you a beautiful view or a DWI, so diffusion rated MRI. These two are the best investigations for brain abscess. This is point number one. Once we see that the patient has a brain abscess. We also see for infarcts in the other areas of the brain, uh, whether the parietal lobe is involved. Some patients present with hemiplegia itself. They come with hemiplegia, uh, gross, uh, uh, you know, involvement of the brain. Such cases are very poor prognostic uh, factors for uh, these patients. Um, the brain abscess actually undergoes various stages of formation. So we pick them up quite early, and so you will not have a capsule. Actually, a capsule forms only after three to four weeks. So when we look at uh, chronic abscesses, you will have capsules. Whereas when you look at acute abscesses, we generally don't find capsules. Uh, it is slightly different in fungal abscesses also. Now, having done that, the first step is we get a neurosurgical opinion. We always, always. Involve neurosurgeons in our team. Having because we are private hospital, we we don't want to take any medical legal uh, issues. So there's always a neurosurgeon opinion taken before the surgery. Now we sit down and decide what is the best approach, whether it is a transnasal approach or a transcranial approach. And most of the time, there is uh, the abscess in contiguity with the uh, cranial base, either the temporal base or the frontal base. Uh, so once we decide on uh, the basi frontal and the basi uh, temporal region, you should understand that these two cisterns are low flow cisterns, and so the incidence of CSF leak is a little low. It's not very high as compared to the posterior fossa. In the posterior fossa, it's very high. Uh, so uh, if you don't repair that, it's going to be very very difficult for you later. But having said that, these abscesses are intradural. That means it's inside the dura, so you have to repair it in the best possible way. You can't have any uh, second question about it because tomorrow the patient can land up with meningitis. So we'll have to plan for reconstruction before we deal with an intradural lesion, like for example, a frontal lobe abscess. Okay. 
Now, uh, we have had an experience of around 16 cases, two cases of extra dual abscess and 14 cases of intra dual abscess. And out of that, uh, I've not exactly categorized temporal versus frontal, but we will be coming out with all the statistics. Um, these uh, patients, uh, last um, corona also, we had two abscesses, and I have a follow up of all the 16. Uh, some have been following up for six months, two or three, and then others have been following up for around uh, average of around one month plus, out of which we have lost four patients, right? Three patients. Three, three patients we have lost already. So the reasons for uh, death in all these cases, number one is uh, one patient we stopped clopidogrel, abexaban, and so the patient developed a pulmonary embolism. So that is the first case which died. The second case? Second case had a malignant hyperthermia. Yeah, the patient had a malignant hyperthermia and uh, we lost general anesthesia, problem. General anesthesia uh, problem. And third was a severe sepsis. Patient clivers, everything. We drilled everything, but it was a doctor's mother and uh, we lost the patient after 18 days. Uh, the abscess record in one case, we uh, drained the abscess after one and a half months, uh, the patient had a reabscess. So the reabscess, the patient didn't want to get operated by me. So uh, I referred him to my neurosurgeon and the neurosurgeon uh, did a bar hole and uh, craniotomy approach and he, he drained the abscess. Now the patient is doing well. So one case of recurrence, three died, others are all living, still living. And we have an average follow-up. The first wave, we have uh, three cases which we are following up. The rest, all cases, we are following up for the past one, one and a half months. Now, uh, no patient uh, yeah, has developed. This is out of how many, sir? This three. 16. Out of 16, three out of 16, three have yes. died okay, sir. already. And uh, now, regarding the age distribution, we found that all the three patients who died are actually above the age of 60. So if the patient presents early age, we have treated one patient with just 29 years of age and that patient actually survived very nicely. He didn't have any complications. So uh, if the abscess presents in the earlier age group, then these patients have very good prognosis. This is what we have observed between 30 and 40. I think all of them do very well. In fact, they don't even come with symptoms. Uh, they go back perfectly normal. The only difference is we start these patients on 10 milligram per kg body weight of uh, liposomal amphotrocin. Now, with respect to the drainage of abscess, we have done almost all cases, all the 16 endoscopically. The most important part of this is not the abscess drainage as such, but removal of all the osteomyelitic bone underneath the abscess. This is the key to success or else all these patients are going to come back maybe one month or two months later with recurrent abscess. This is what I want to emphasize here. Draining an abscess is just the tip of the iceberg. But we have always found that all these patients with abscess have osteomyelitis of the skull base, that part of the skull base. I don't know whether this is actually an incontinuity problem. It is not a blood spread. This is what I have observed. Greater being osteoid involved, temporal lobe abscess. Uh, today or tomorrow. But temporal lobe abscess, all patients had greater wing osphenoid involvement. So this is what we have consistently observed. So uh, if I just do a little bit of drilling of that and just open up the abscess, he's going to have a recurrence again. So what we do is completely remove all that osteomyelitic bone uh, uh, underneath the greater wing osphenoid completely and then make the neck. And then now we have started suturing the dura also. We have started suturing the dura we want to make an airtight seal. This is very important. I don't want to leave it just like that. Sometimes we suture the dura. Sometimes we uh, reconstruct with a good flap. Uh, we have done, I think, four or five pericranial flaps already for the frontal lobe abscesses. And of course, for the temporal lobe abscesses, still we have not tried the temporoparietal flap, but we had a cross coat uh, nasal septal flap. And in one case, we also did a, a lateral nasal wall flap from the other side. So, but it was slightly short, we used a reimbursement of facial attack. So now I am very, very particular that when you cover a skull base with a flap, then all that area should have no fungus. You should completely take it, take off all that bone, drill off all that bone. And if you are doing a, a temporal lobe, then the clivus, the greater wing of sphenoid, or the carotid, all that should be taken off. 
and only then you have to drain the abscess drainage comes last for me and that is the uh, uh, when i do that that should be no osteomyelitic bone at all and i will see whether the uh, abscess is a chronic abscess or an acute abscess if it's going to be chronic i'll have a beautiful capsule and i go ahead and excise the capsule i completely excise the capsule and what is the point of excision we will see the normal pia but having said this we have found that in abscess you have a lot of gliosis so the bone is a little uh, the the brain is a little supple so i try to take off that um, um, the the capsule and then you find a gliotic brain that is where i stop or if you don't have a, a clear cut capsule then the pus drains out and finally you have clear csf coming out and that is the point at which i stop till that i keep on irrigating i try to get that csf out and then finally i close it so uh, with regards to a uh, brain involvement uh, it is uh, um, yet to be seen because we don't have long term follow ups so you have to wait for one year i'm sure that i will be facing 50% mortality my expectation of these uh, are going to be out of my 16 cases uh, but two were extra dural they are completely normal they are walking very beautifully and uh, I, i have beautiful videos all all pre op post op everything documented uh apart from that 14 cases i'm going to lose seven patients that is what i feel on the long run so my expectation if i expect more than 50% in these cases i think i'm going to be unrealistic uh i might have even 70% uh, mortality in these cases on the long run uh this is my conclusion about the abscess and uh, and i never operate inside the operation theater without the presence of a neurosurgeon so a uh, neurosurgeon is always always there and he will be there to tell the relative that he has uh, been involved in the surgery because it's a private hospital of course uh, in a government hospital you may not need it because they are always there like a, a das uh, some duty uh, surgeons are there so they can afford that but in a private hospital the patient last uh, have you involved a neurosurgeon or not so this is a very important thing uh having said that i really appreciate anthony uh, professor anthony because he says that you know the skull based work has increased improved and many centers are doing it i really appreciate because skull base have have been shouting skull base for the past 17 years now and uh, this was all i used to breathe breathe eat skull base and now i am so happy that the whole uh, country uh, people like you youngsters are taking up skull base in a big way i'm so thankful Uh, to uh, mucor but i i, I mean the patients are uh, suffering but even then we are able to get our hands on skull base really appreciate your uh, initiative to conduct this program uh, i think if i start sharing my videos it will take a long time let let me do it in a different uh, webinar thank you very much dr gosh you can put this uh, panel open to the others thank you sir so uh, i have couple of because we did the heading as invasive fungal we didn't put it as mucor so i would like to finish it with the other fungus as well so my question to shobhan babu sir that did you get aspergillus or any other invasive uh, fungal sinusitis post covid in this time or did you get mixed infection aspergillus plus mucor most of them were mucor some of them are come as aspergillus but they were all invasive So, so did you get the same invasive, same as invasive fungal sinusitis with liposomal amputation and uh, aggressive surgical design? Yeah, Shilpi has got an experience of uh, double fungus. He is, she has operated personally on uh, in hospital for your one. Shilpi can answer that question. we have seen few cases in which, in which mucor was associated with aspergillosis also and uh, one thing i noted about such pa such patients were their immune status and their diabetic uh, status is not very well controlled and uh, mostly uh, the cases i operated they were uh, the aspergillosis was, was non invasive it was more of a common ball yeah the yes, like ball involvement and uh, Uh, our infectious disease uh, uh, specialist advise not to start on voriconazole and uh, we on such patient we emphasized very strongly on uh, uh, sugar control as well as uh, increasing the immunity uh, 
but they were these patients were more aggressive they had more aggressive spread more faster spread from axilla to clivus they went very fast there was very aggressive disease spread do you do any blood test for uh, aspergillus i have seen mainly the physician and infectious disease specialists they love to write those tests whereas we believe more on the biopsy no we believe more on the biopsy and we didn't do for any such test okay okay Shravan Babu sir, another question that uh, somehow in my institute I found most of the KOH mount and the microbiology culture sensitivity came negative. Only HP kept coming positive. What happened in the medical colleges? Did you get proper information from micro or the patho? So microbiology is more reliable. They have been reporting within twenty-four hours. Uh, just like what we send, uh, they do it at KOH mount. So that is uh, an immediate report almost within twenty-four hours. So the KOH has been more consistent in identifying these cases, and the histopathology reports, of course, followed after one week or two days, and we compared both. And uh, most of them uh, are detected by KOH. Definitely, an experienced microbiologist with a special say will definitely tell you whether it is a new or or uh, any other kind. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have one question, Sampurna, if you permit. Yes, sure, sir. See, uh, I was. Uh, this is a question to the oculo plastic surgeon. There is a small observation in our center uh, about this orbital excentration. The people who have underwent orbital excentration yes, have presented on the third day with uh, some sort of a cerebrovascular event. Okay. Okay. So the most of them had uh, infarction. Did you did you come across of any of such cases or you have any experience about this exaggeration cases having yeah so uh, the presence of a cerebrovascular event because of exaggeration or as a result of it is not likely to happen what is very possible is that there are simultaneous disease processes taking place even beyond the orbit that maybe initially were not recognized it's possible as the disease evolves the mri also changes and we may have missed it at a time when maybe an excentration was supposed to happen so but as a result of excentration cerebrovascular events is unlikely i have not but seen that our surgeons had an interesting observation out of 48 cases uh, they have done yeah. only 12 cases yeah occurred after third day of right. excentration Right. I just want to have a comment on this. Uh, if I can comment, uh, yeah. uh, did you observe the cavernous sinus and the superior orbital fissure in all these cases? Because orbital excentration necessarily stops short at the level of the superior orbital fissure, but we can easily miss disease in the cavernous sinus. So if you miss the disease in the cavernous sinus, you have to audit, re-audit your pre-op uh, pre scans and see whether it is due to the orbital excentration, which is extremely unlikely. Extremely, I can just underline and say. As I told you, sir, we have a team of. I think you have to examine the cavernous sinus in all these cases, and that can really produce problems, which you said. Yeah, which is yeah. why we have a team of people, neurosurgeons, sitting together and deciding about the involvement of cavernous sinus and all, but uh, we could not find anything yeah. pre-operative. So that was an interesting thing. Uh, thought, uh, in a cerebrovascular event. Okay. Because not we're okay. quite we're anterior to the cavernous sinus, and necessarily your dissection from an external route cannot go beyond the bony apex. So, it's possible that it was happening concom, and was realized was a few days. Dr. Rashi, one question that, uh, as you know, the huge number of cases now. We lot of ENT surgeons are doing orbital excentration ourselves. We are not able to call, or you you guys also don't have time to attend each cases. So, mm -hmm. like, what will be your tips for me or the ENT surgeons who are doing the excentration, so that in future I can send for the reconstruction to you? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, in the first point that I would like to highlight, in cases of mucormycosis, I know we are all very keen to provide the patient with a cosmetically. uh you know beautiful socket and something that can work with the prosthesis later on but it's very important that before you worry about the cosmesis you worry about excenterating up to the orbital apex 
the most important thing to do when you're reaching when you're doing it from an external route is to go so deep that beyond that your instruments are not able to be maneuvered you have to go that deep even after that you have to basically it's not just removing of the main orbital mass the apex tissue will not come out with the globe and the surrounding muscles that's much deeper that will be a phase 2 of your excentration the last 20 minutes or 15 minutes where you painstakingly remove all the fat all the infected uh, you know vascular tissue or orbital tissue whatever there is up to the apex and ideally you stop when you start seeing bleed from the apical tissues uh it's important also to send the apex as a separate sample so that you recognize whether there's any mucor in your uh you know the latest uh, or the most posterior aspect of your dissection cosmetically uh the socket as such even if you left an open socket would slowly over time granulate what we do to make sure that this is hastened and a prosthesis can be fit better is that we keep the skin of the eyelids on top so this is known as an eyelid sparing excentration where 2 mm away from each lid margin you spare you start sparing your skin all the way to the orbital rims and everything below the skin orbicularis layer is included in your dissection right okay. so as long as you can allow suturing of the wound without much tension it's unlikely to dehisce also unless there is frank skin involvement which usually happens over the cheek or over the inferior orbital rim which is something that you may have to reconstruct with skin grafts or you know uh, undermining tissue at a later stage but i would say that considering that excentration may be new territory for a lot of surgeons the focus should be on doing a good and deep excentration and worrying about the cosmesis and the reconstruction part even later that's very very practical advice i have a comment and a question okay uh, we have been doing uh, i i am very uh, very much interested in orbital work uh, pre uh, co mucor itself we have presented a lot of papers on orbit so we are trained endoscopically so uh, the comment is this basically uh, what we found in mucor is that it involves the posterior orbit rather than the anterior orbit so the globe is generally spare so what i start doing we we do completely endoscopic so if the superior orbital fissure is involved i uh, instead of doing it last we start first because that is where all our energy should be and the last 20 minutes is where the surgeon is already exhausted so i always say go for the most difficult area first because you are fresh so what i usually do is i start dissecting from the optic canal and then i go to the superior orbital fissure many people here at least uh, in, in many parts of the world i've seen are not very conversant with the superior orbital fissure dissection so uh, if you want to do a complete dissect the end point of it should be the carotid artery you should keep your uh, uh, doppler and you check because the superior orbital superior orbital fissure is the anterior uh, extension of the cavernous sinus uh, not the anterior extension the, uh, the anterior border is the uh, superior orbital fissure posterior is the cavernous sinus the cavernous sinus has the carotid artery so i generally go right till the cavernous sinus and then i dissect if there is any thrombus there i just take it off till fresh bleed comes from the cavernous sinus i see the carotid artery and then i pack it there so this is point number 1 having said that we should be careful about csf leak there so uh, dissection of the superior orbital fissure is extremely delicate unless you have got really trained it's uh, even i have seen several uh, even the ophthalmologists they not trained going intradurally Uh, uh right inside the superior because there are three rings in the superior orbital fissure medial middle and lateral you have to dissect all the three links converge on and then go right on to the cavernous sinus so this is my comment on dissection of the orbit having said that i have found that several people are propagating a uh, posterior orbital dissection sparing the globe so uh, they just retain that optic nerve and because they give a uh, uh, sort of you know sort of a uh, a cosmetically better result in my opinion in my opinion this is also a question and an opinion it is not good because we have seen that when in the first wave we did that we tried because the patient didn't want the globe globe to be removed what happened was when we preserved it the uh, the globe moves backwards and so what happens is there is a definite thysis bulbi and there's no and my author colleague says i'm not able to put in a socket properly because you you 
kept that globe and I, I, that is hindering into my um, uh, into my uh, cosmetic uh, pro procedure so uh, I, I, there are so many people propagating in india just remove that part of the that orbital debridement is different from removal of the posterior orbit if you remove the complete posterior orbit leave alone the globe what's the use now my question to you is what's your recommendation if the posterior part of the orbit is completely in what would you recommend the removal of the globe or would you uh, recommend leaving behind the globe for, and which will give you a better uh, chance for a good cosmetic uh, procedure yeah. so i looked in the beginning when it was basically a few freelancers going back and forth with our mentors also discussing all these cases i have come to the conclusion that there is no replacement for 24 hour to 48 hour review if you are in a position to make decisions at a short in a short period of time you can actually wait and gradually increase your you know level of uh, whatever treatment so to answer your question i would say this if you are going to touch the posterior one third of the orbit you are going to lose vision that's one thing that the patient has to be very clear about if my ent surgeon or my ocular plastic surgeon enters my orbit there is a chance that i might spare vision in the anterior to mid part but no one can touch the optic nerve go around it dissect around it and expect that 6 by 6 vision or whatever is maintained number one number two if there is any resource limitation whether it is the presence of a specialist the absence of amphotericin b injections or comorbidities in the patient i would suggest keeping a very low threshold for exenteration which always means removing the globe the muscles and everything else up to the apex and beyond in cases where i have done i have i am quite a conservative surgeon having said that i do exenteration only when i am sure that there is no recourse there are quite a few patients who have had flagrant cellulitic symptoms with loss of vision and uh, motility restrictions that because i was confident i was able to do a 24 to 48 hour review and they were getting better in front of me i have managed to conserve their orbits there are combinations where vision is preserved but there is complete loss of motility restriction and the orbit looks inflamed those also were spared and till today it's a 3 to 4 month follow up so far have done well the the point here to note is that if you have the orbital involvement with posterior cavernous sinus sov thrombosis then your prognosis becomes worse and worse in that situation trying to uh trying to remove only a part of the orbit uh, attempting to spare vision and then definitely getting the patient back on table in a matter of days is not an ideal situation no no my my question was different hmm uh, it was not about vision my question hmm. is if you have uh maybe a little vision yeah. or oh, i understand the, you the the globe yeah. is the anterior part and you have hmm. the optic nerve yeah. and you have the extraocular muscles yeah. completely and the fat yeah. now there are propagates of uh, you know a school of thought where they say you debride all the muscles all the uh, fat and then you just leave behind the optic nerve alone and the globe yeah so, so do you recommend know, that alone yeah so what is the long term uh, correct so the first concern for the for the ophthalmologist who was debating with you was that the globe became inophthalmic this will happen if the orbital floor below the globe has also been removed in that situation just clearing the posterior part is not forget vision is not going to change the position of the globe whether the globe becomes thysical or becomes inophthalmic will depend upon the amount of bone that has been removed around because contents then get to spread into the sinuses causing reduction in volume in the orbit if you have only posterior involvement the sinuses have been maximally debrided and iv amphotericin b is going on i would get, give about a 48 hour threshold in which i would try orbital ampho b and if there is no improvement i would go ahead with exenteration no i am still not clear madam i'm sorry no problem there is see uh, my my question is yeah the posterior part of the globe has been removed the so orbit has been the removed orbit of the yeah. orbit has been yeah. the floor of the orbit eventually gets its blood supply either from the uh, max or from inside the ophthalm so 
both of them are disrupted because the posterior part of the globe is completely gone. I have seen people leaving behind that shelf of bone, which is again becoming osteomyelitis. Correct. Now, now the thing is, if you remove the posterior part of the globe alone, keep the optic nerve intact, mm. and then just the anterior part of the globe alone is just there, mm. will it be an uh, advantage with respect to cosmesis, with respect yes. to the future, future processes, will it hinder the processes, or would you recommend that you, what is the use of a globe? Uh, uh, without vision, without extraocular movements, what's the use of that? Okay. Instead of that, you can so, give a beautiful socket and uh, fantastically uh, rehabilitate the patient. So there's one thing we have to understand. Exenteration processes are very, very inferior to the processes that we put inside the eyelids in a globe replacement. The processes that you put after you've removed orbital tissue is just on top of your skin layer or your granulated socket. It is immobile eyelids with just the appearance of an eye from very far away. When you put a PMMA eye into the eyelids, which is what you do in cases of enucleation or evisceration where only the globe is removed, that provides a much more superior cosmesis. You're talking about eyelid sparring, right? No. So that's the, I think there, there's a little bit of confusion here. When you do an eyelid sparing exenteration, your eyelids don't move anymore. Okay, so you've basically closed off Absolutely. the orbit with skin. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you rehabilitate that? You put a adhesive, adhesive sticker or a magnetic sticker on top of that skin. Okay. That is an immobile PMMA painted and drawn 3D reconstruction. Okay. Anybody with two seconds of observation skill will tell the patient that, yeah, what is this weird plastic eye you have on one side, which is not moving. Okay. The cosmesis you get from procedures where only the globe is removed is different and it's way better, which is why in any case, if you have a chance where you can prevent exenteration, you must take it. The cosmesis is always superior. If there is a debate on life, don't make that choice. But if there's a debate on cosmesis or not, then exenteration cosmesis, however good, is always inferior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Uh, thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Sure, sir. Thank you. Dr. Ashi, can you see the MRI? Yeah, Sapurna. Yeah, I think uh, continuing with Janki Ram sir's question, suppose this patient, this patient, when they came to me, he was already blind, even though there was no proptosis, no ophthalmoplegia, no yeah. eye pain. But I think sudden, I mean, retinal artery occlusion or whatever, he came blind. Very now, good. in these cases, so probably what sir is asking, there are a few ENT surgeons or whatever school of thought, they are telling just endoscopically remove this part mm. and, and keep the rest of it. So do mm. you recommend that or will you recommend no, the orbital apex is involved, remove the whole thing. So for future reconstruction, which will be better? That is the question. Yeah, yeah. see, uh, if, you, if you remove this part of the... Uh... Uh, the, the orbit alone. You remove the posterior complete, leave behind only the globe. Anyway, that eyelid is not going to move, right? Of will course it will. Why will it not? You're going to remove all the muscles. You're going to remove all the no, nerves. The muscles are separate. See, at the end of the day, you at least have some, there are, there are two muscles in the eyelid also. There's one Mueller's and there's one LPS. You okay. will have some kind of motility anteriorly. Okay. And things might grow back, re-innovation, cross-innovation might happen. There is at least the chance. Mm -hmm. okay. I personally would agree with you in saying that removing that posterior one-third of the orbit is a very dicey affair in any mucor case, frankly. If you're going to go in and invade the uh, channels this way, you might as well do an exenteration or you don't touch it. Just for the sake of argument, I would say that the cosmesis in both cases would be different. But I would agree with you, Dr. Jankiram, that I don't think removing just the posterior third of the orbit is going to, at least in my experience, benefit the patient anyway, because they always recur. There is always a small nidus that remains behind. However, unless you're doing some, you know, microscopically excellent dissection, which is not really possible because uh, these things will come back. The cosmesis part is a different story in both cases. So that we're going to get a little confused in. So let's ignore that for a while. This particular case, considering Sampurna has said there's no vision, 
maybe there's ophthalmoplegia also. If the sinuses have been maximally debrided and intravenous amphotericin B is going on, I will give the patient 48 hours. If he improves on my watch in 48 to 72 hours, I will observe. If there is no... Oh, what, what do you want to improve? What, what, what is it that you will test? The ophthalmoplegia. No, he doesn't have ophthalmoplegia at all. His only vision is mobile in all direction. Only then, not then I will not touch. Okay. Definitely. I will definitely just observe. I will give orbital amphotericin B. But don't you think uh, keeping that will cause a cavernous sinus spread and other intracranial spread? Yeah. I would because tell you that, that, that didn't because... happen actually because the yeah. doctors gave exactly that yeah. opinion. That yeah. is why I could not enter. And yeah. patient also said when eye doctor is saying why you want to operate. Yeah. After so what was the IC thrombosis? Correct. Luckily, he's surviving, but Correct. it happened. Yeah. So that's what I'm telling you. One more thing. I would make these decisions knowing that I can review the patient on a very short term. I have found that more and more, we keep forgetting that that is a very crucial point in our decision making. If I'm going to see this patient once in 10 days, I will not risk anything but the most extreme management. If I'm going to see this patient every day, I will recognize. Do you really feel the intraorbital amphobi works? Huh. So this is also a very big debate point. Frankly, I have seen literally less than 50% improvement in my patients, particularly if you're looking for very posterior or retro orbital extensions, it doesn't work for that. It may make sense if you have some inflammation in one or two recti muscles, maybe some inflammation focused in one extracornal compartment, but it will not. And the point is that you may need multiple doses to see any kind of improvement. That itself can be quite a scary uh, adverse effect, you know, production there because the eye swells up a lot. You have to give a lot of anti-inflammatories to kind of keep it down. In fact, immediately and deteriorates the vision, which caused a lot of panic in the patients. I, I would always advise that the lamina papracia or the orbital floor be at least removed, not for the purpose of B, but coincidentally have been removed in such patients. In those, I'm much more confident of giving amphotericin B without any adverse effects. Amphotericin B doesn't work for necrotic tissue. It works for inflamed tissue. So that's also important. If you have a necrotic focus in the orbit, you cannot treat it with injections. You have to remove, you have to debride. I think there comes the role of contrast enhanced MRI where you can differentiate which part is taking the contrast and which is completely gone. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's an important, it's a very useful um, adjunct for us, yes. I think, uh, uh, sir, uh, Jankiram sir has to summarize the session now. It has been uh, 7.30 and it has been very useful to us. And I have last one question for you while you summarize. That uh, look, sir, uh, mucomycosis, when it used to come a uh, couple of years back also, we used to call our own mentors. Sir, this case has come, what to do? Or little difficult, we'll refer them off. But this scenario is completely different. It, we can't keep on referring only to tertiary center or only to skull base surgeon. We had to do because it was the huge numbers. And while doing, we learned a lot of things. We are still learning. And not everybody has all the equipments. I mean, you may have stored skull base drill, somebody doesn't have. I may have population I have, somebody doesn't have. So what will you say the basic things uh, to do mucor cases or skull base cases? And uh, if you don't have skull base uh, uh, bar or if you don't have the neurosurgeons along with you, can you do some kind of modification with the Metronics and M5 and piece what you have? So I want you to give these kind of take home message for like people like us who are beginning phase of their practice, but still they want to take the challenge and when to not to touch and when to refer. Very difficult question to answer. Uh, basically, my uh, it's a good question actually. Uh, I mean, uh, everybody wants to become skull base surgeons. And uh, this is a uh, time where we are hard pressed to become skull base surgeons. We have to become skull base surgeons because of the numbers, sheer numbers. You can't refer them to skull base centers. You have to operate. But uh, fortunately, this mucor uh, we have seen has not got high mortality, like the pre-COVID era, where I have seen patients dying. 
now we are far more equipped uh, in the sense by knowledge we are able to do an mri we are able to detect disease we work as a team and uh, all this has come inside and uh, so i think for the youngsters it's better that uh, we keep learning from such webinars and uh, improving ourselves our skills i think uh, we'll be there soon uh, it's not that it's a rocket science anybody can do it it's just a matter of numbers and you have to perfect uh, i always keep telling my juniors don't bother about the number of surgeries you did or i've seen some people saying that i've done 10 cases a day i think that is not the uh, point even if you do one case you do it perfectly you do the the right thing absolutely to your brilliant knowledge and according to the mri and if you have done that i think uh, i don't see any reason why uh, you know you should refer at all uh, i mean you don't have to and with the numbers 40000 people have been treated so how can uh, you know you keep referring 40000 people here that's not possible for anywhere for that matter in the world so i honestly believe that you learn the best way for juniors is that you do a case and then you review your video you put that video review your video the same night you keep and then you follow the best uh, results you get as a surgeon is only through your follow ups and you should be very honest with your follow ups see this is what i have done this is what i have done this is what i this is how the patient progresses by your follow ups and the first step to success is a failure always don't get pissed off by failures you will have failures there's no doubt about it but if you learn from your failures you will be wiser so this is what i always advise my juniors you have to do it you are hard pressed to do it do your best review your videos learn from your failures and improve and don't ever uh, feel bad about your failure and don't uh, you know try to conceal it from the patient always tell him honestly yes i have had a failure let me do it again so i have been doing the same thing i have had 10 failures my own cases i've done after 17 years of skull base i've had 10 failures in what i've done and all the 10 i have revised free of cost i generally revise all my cases free of cost so this is one thing number two to summarize it i just want to tell you is a very good panel uh, and a very good initiative by dr uh, sampurna ghosh and uh, very young a dynamic energetic uh, enthusiastic skull base surgeon in the making of all already made and uh, definitely will be making a big name in the world i am sure that uh, this uh, mucor uh, uh, mycosis is going to give sprouts many sprouts of good skull base surgeons all across the country and the only thing is they should have, i attend even the smallest webinars in mucor mycosis wherever it is i attend the webinar i i make it a point in my house i switch it on or i ask dr sri harsha to record it and send it to me because one point i gain by that then i am wiser by that and more importantly i want to do a lot of studies i'm just going i'm sitting every day and studying my cases what what have i done what have i done wrong what have i done overdoing or underdoing so all these try to review uh, excellent webinar involving the uh, facio maxillary the ocular plastic surgeon as well as uh, very good senior people uh, very well done and uh, shilpi you got something to say uh i would like to say that uh, the more the posterior compartment is involved the more you start depending on your instrumentation and experience so what is a normal clavicle bone what is an abnormal clavicle bone only when you are more experienced you can have a more grip in an abnormal anatomy so anterior part of uh, involvement of mucor is easier is easier Yes. So the posterior part of involvement of the mucor gets, I think, needs a little bit experience. Yes. So um, there is a tricky area, and there your instrumentation also comes into uh, picture. So I fully agree. See the anterior part, the maxilla and the palate, especially the uh, ethmoids, maxilla and palate. These three areas are quite benign, and they don't cause death of the patient. They don't. Uh, I have not seen even palatal sequestrum causing massive complications. but the posterior disease the superior disease these two are where you should have mentors like for example experienced people near you you can call them and operate under supervision because that is very important because uh, i have seen so many cases in internal carotid artery completely 
a filled of granulation filled with granulation i am tensed when i when i completely scrape the granulation from the carotid artery and especially the meckel scrape the the of the lingual process of sphenoid after now four cases of lingual process of sphenoid excision all that is tough even for the most experienced skull base surgeon so posterior skull base always have a mentor anterior skull base go ahead and operate so this is what i always believe thank you very much thank you sir i think you have to uh, organize uh, cadaver dissection uh, workshop uh, for a lot of surgeons now now onward because a lot of people will be interested to learn skull base now and that is what we need as dr shilki said to learn the normal anatomy other than that there is no other way to have the 3d kind of uh, anatomical concept so can we call it a day thank you very much thank you janaki ram thank you very much thank you. thank you the panel uh, thank you sir for giving your time thank you sampurna thank you thank sir you, sir your sessions have been really really relevant and interesting so yes ma'am we look forward to many your, more with you without your effort this would have wouldn't have happened and we continued for long so it was supposed to be 5 yes, and now it is 737 and your team is still with us uh, many many no problem thank you so much ma'am thank you everyone rohan is also there i don't know thanks rohan